part of how I ended up being a poet, though I'm a historian too, but as I always had this deep love and appreciation for things, but at the same time, I I liked learning the backstory and the, the deeper, darker side too. And then the challenge was, you know, can you still love it and also know the dark side and, and kind of find a happy medium between it all? And there's this quote from Nelson Algren who who wrote a lot about Chicago. And he said, in, in order to wrap any kind of joint, you got to love it a little while. And so like, uh, you know, before you start singing songs about something or singing these praise songs, you have to know the whole history anyway. And so I, I really do, you know, love LA with every ounce of my being, but I do know all the, all the ins and outs too. But I think the love started as a kid. And, and then later on, as you get older, you fill in the blanks. <laughs> This is Five Places, Los Angeles, a living documentary of the city produced by the LA Forum for Architecture and Urban Design. I'm Emmanuel Bourrier, executive producer and usually your host, but today I'm beyond thrilled to share our first Plus Two episode. As you know, if you follow the show, I ask each guest to name someone whom they in turn would choose to ask about the five places that define Los Angeles for them. And we call those episodes Plus Ones. Lori Lipton, the extraordinary artist whom I interviewed in episode 8, then interviewed the amazing art critic Shana Niestembrot in episode 12. Shana, in turn, chose Mike Songson as her plus one, making today's interview our very first plus two. Mike Songson, also known as Mike the Poet, is an acclaimed poet, professor, journalist, historian, and tour guide. He teaches at Woodbury University, where he serves as the coordinator of the school's first-year experience program. He has published over 500 essays and poems, most recently two excerpts in Dear California, The Golden State, in Diaries and Letters, edited by David Kippen and published by Stanford University Press. He has delivered over 2,000 poetry readings, served as guest speaker at over 100 academic institutions, appeared on radio and television, and hosted events in locations like Grand Performances and Getty Center. The second edition of his latest book, Letters to My City, was just published by Writ Large Press in summer 2023. Mike's knowledge of and love for Los Angeles run deep. I highly recommend reading his work and also checking out his terrific annual list published by L.A. Taco of the best books about Los Angeles. It's all in the show notes, along with Mike's full bio and links to the people and places he mentions. I also recommend listening until the end for a beautiful surprise that nearly made my heart explode. Huge thanks to Shana and Mike for sharing their love of Los Angeles with us. Let's drop in. Okay, hello, Mike. Shana, Shana, Shana. Yeah. It is such a pleasure to see you. Thank you for um, being such a good sport about me dropping you in it. Uh, But as I mentioned to you, I could not think of a better person to be interviewed on the Five Places LA podcast because to my mind, it's like, if I had a question about LA history, you'd be better than Google. Like I would, I would just ask you. I've never seen a person who has internalized and loved and honored and breathes the air of like every corner of what Los Angeles is and has been than you. I am like in awe of you and your relationship to the city. So I am so excited that you agreed to appear with me as my plus one today. Thank you, Shane. I'm I'm honored to be in conversation with you. It's going to be fun. Hopefully not too fun. We have a tendency to kind of go like, you know, what's that saying? Digression is the sunshine of literature. It gets real sunny (laughs) around here. Well, but I'll do my best to keep us Okay, so the five questions are the five questions, and I feel like we'll just jump right in uh, because the first questions are what I would want to know anyway, namely numero uno being, and I know it's kind of part two because how long have you lived in LA is a million years your whole life. And question two is, therefore, if you were born here, um, what brought your family here and just describe what that has been about for you growing up Angelino. Absolutely. I believe 
if most of my family came to LA in like the 19 teens. And um, one of my grandmothers came when she was like three years old in the early 1920s or something. But um, my grandfather, my mom's father was my, was my extra super connection to LA history. He was born in 1918 and he came to LA. His parents came to LA like three weeks before he was born. And his father worked on the Union Pacific Railroad, and he met my great grandmother in Mexico. And so my grandfather was his mother was Mexican, and his father was like British. Uh, well, he was American, but he was maybe from England one or two generations before. But he had worked on the Union Pacific Railroad and spoke Spanish, and and met a woman in Mexico, and they came up to L.A. and my grandfather was born. And my grandfather was baptized at Alvera Street, and uh, he was. He went to both Jefferson High School and then he went to Fremont High School. I think he went to two years of Jefferson and two years of Fremont um, in the 1930s. And he was an old Angelino who just always told me a million stories about different L.A. neighborhoods. And he's in many ways, my parents, too, my mom and dad as well. But my my grandfather was, the you know, grandparents can grandparents have that extra special relationships where they can always be the good guy. And so yeah, <laughs> there was and the whole- grandkids are like the ideal captive audience for all their stories like their kids our parents don't want to hear it but we're like seven and that's what's up and you're getting it all right my grandfather and I were a pair you know we're driving all over the place and he lived the last 40 years of his life in Long Beach um they, they bought a house in Long Beach in the early 1960s but my whole childhood was spent driving around with him going all over the place and him telling me a million stories about a different, a lot of different things. And when I went to UCLA at 18 in 1992, I took an LA history class and all of a sudden everything my grandfather ever told me was being echoed, but also I was learning the deeper context and finding out more, more, more details and why it mattered and who it was and, um, you know, and, and my grandfather was more maybe maybe more romantic and nostalgic, but the his stories were the gateway, and then everything else was was as you know the the deeper and deeper and deeper stories. And there's layers and layers of learning, even things like the L.A. River. I remember seeing it in in Greece and seeing it in the Terminator, and I remember driving over the L.A. River. You, you know, dr- and and my grandfather and I used to ride our bikes on the San Gabriel River because his house was in Long Beach right next to El Dorado Park. And when El Dorado Park was first built in Long Beach in the 60s, it was part of it was like a runoff basin for the river because the rivers would flood. And Long Beach, a lot of Long Beach is nestled in between the San Gabriel River and the Los Angeles River. And cities like Long Beach and Lakewood would flood when the rivers would flood. And so my grandfather and I would ride our bikes from Long Beach to Seal Beach on the San Gabriel River. And I remember learning the histories of the rivers when I was more like 19 or 20. But when I was 12 or eight or 14, I was riding my bikes on the, on the river, you know? And, and so you, you learn these different contexts and, you know, we just remember there was the, the wetlands and then there was oil wells in the wetlands, (laughs) you know, the Los Cerritos wetlands. And, um, and, and so I, 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 I think part of how I ended up being a poet, though I'm a historian too, but as I always had this deep love and appreciation for things, but at the same time, I've, I, I, I liked learning the backstory and the, the deeper, darker side too. And then the challenge was, you know, can you still love it and also know the dark side and, and kind of find a happy medium between it all. And there's this quote from Nelson Algren who, who wrote a lot about Chicago. And he said, in, in order to wrap any kind of joint, you got to love it a little while. And so like, you know, before you, start singing songs about something or singing these praise songs, you have to know the whole history anyway. And so I I really do, you know, love LA with every ounce of my being, but I do know all the, all the ins and outs too. But I think the love started as a kid. And and then later on, as you get older, you you fill in the blanks. (laughs) So to speak. Yeah. And I think it's such an interesting um, nexus where you are as a kind of, poet, historian, journalist, you know, I mean, you're not like an investigative reporter, but you investigate and report. And the poetry is a spoken word practice. And I know from experience, 
not entirely different than taking one of your walking tours. Really not that different. Maybe a little bit less rhyming, <laughs> prose, but you're you, like in all of those um, roles that you occupy. And I think what you're describing about how you grew up is kind of like explains why you don't see those things as different. Yeah. And, you know, I was I've been rereading Joan Didion and um, my big. Yeah, yeah. You know, my my big early influences were, were always, you know, Mike Davis and early 90s hip hop. But I read a lot of Joan Didion, too. And I loved Slouching Towards Bethlehem and I loved the White Album and. Joan Didion's literary journalism and her investigation. I love, I love to investigate, you know, and find the obscure author. I was just at my daughter's high school yesterday and I found a, a, a mural done by a little known, but very influential Chicano muralist. Uh, there's this muralist named Robert Arenavar, and he's not as well known as he should be. I learned about him from Paul Boteo and, and, um, and I was walking through Mark Keppel high school with my daughter and I saw a mural and I went and looked and in the corner it said Robert Renovar. And I said, that's amazing. Cause Robert Renovar is, is kind of rare, but he, he, and he passed in the 1980s, but he was, he wasn't as well known as Osco or Gronk or, or Judy Baca, but he was super influential. And so I love finding these little obscure tidbits and, and they, the only way you find the obscure tidbits, as you know, is pounding the pavement and, and I mean, and digging into the books too, but the combination of, of walking around and going places and seeing things and visiting, you know, you're visiting a friend. In this case, I was even just at the back to school night of my daughter's high school, but boom, there was this historic mural done in 1975. Amazing. I have a feeling that's going to migrate onto one of your walking tours one of these days. So you heard it here, <laughs> uh, which actually, you know what, that's a perfect segue into the like, big question of the five places LA podcast, which is what are your five places? Um, they've been asked, you know, we ask that it's Emmanuel asked this question, I think in a really beautiful way, because it's not weigh in with authority on the five places that everyone needs to know because, you know, textbook, Cliff Notes, what is Los Angeles? It is so personal. And it really is about what defines your Los Angeles. And you have a bigger Los Angeles, I think, than most people I know. So we probably should have given you 10, but it's called Five Places. And here we are. So what are they, Mike? I was having a hard time. I had so many. I, I have five and I, I do want to say a few honorable mentions at the end, but uh, I've, the five, the first one I'm going to start with is the Cascades Park in Monterey Park. It's this park that has this waterfall fountain. And I found that park on accident in 1999 with my buddy Phil. And I actually wrote about it in letters to my city. I wrote a little short essay about it, but it's this beautiful kind of art deco park with a cool little fountain you know poured concrete fountain and it lights up at night and it's off atlantic boulevard in between the 10 and the 60 and in 1999 my good friend phil and i we used to take these drives on purpose we'd get lost on purpose we'd get in the car and just start driving and wherever we would land and we found this park and I read that place. essay and i think yeah. I thought it was a metaphor because it was too beautiful to be real it, it, you know, it was one of those things like, is this real? And it was sort of a metaphor, but it was actually, it's actually a real park. And I now, I now live three blocks from that park. And, and the funny, the funny story is, is that we found it in 1999 and thought it was beautiful. And we just chalked it up to another one of our sun sunset drives, you know, those drives you take at sunset. And especially in the late nineties, we were doing that a lot. We were playing the roots, you know, Illadelph half-life there's, um, their record there and and we would take these drives and put on a good record and 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 just have some fun but um that park was we had a beautiful experience so then four four and a half years later i meet uh, emmy who became who eventually became my wife she grew up three blocks away from that park and, and and like within the first couple of weeks of being with her um one day we're driving through the neighborhood and, and I see that park. I was like, oh my God, I never knew I could find that park again. And uh, 
that park also is where you see a lot of wedding photos and quinceanera photos and people walking their dog. And now I walk my dog there pretty often. And it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful park, uh, the Cascades park, but it's just this little small park. And uh, I love the Cascades park and it was built in the late 1920s and the, the developers of Monterey park wanted to create an attraction that would lure people into buying homes. And at one point in time, they wanted Monterey Park to, to be like a Beverly Hills or to be an upscale neighborhood. And they were going to even build an outdoor amphitheater, like a Hollywood Bowl mm -hmm. in the hill. Because uh, Atlantic goes through these two hills. And Monterey Park is basically three hills. And it's just sandwiched in between Alhambra and Montebello and just past East LA and just a little south of Pasadena. So next to City Terrace and you're by the 710 freeway between the 10 and the 60. And so there's these three hills, but Cascades comes down the hill and opposite on the other side of the hill was going to be a, an outdoor theater. But the Great Depression happened and the stock market crash happened and everything got put on hold. And so that was never built. And then the neighborhood really was developed more in the 40s, like around the wartime. But the park was built in 1928, 29 just before the just before the stock market crash and the great depression so i love the cascades park yeah i do too i've never even been there and i already love it i can't wait i've lived here since 1995 and you're one of one of something that except for now remembering your essay and yeah. again i thought it was like quasi fictional because it was so magical that there was no way so okay one new place what else you got you know, there's so many different things, but I, the next one I'm going to say for me is is beyond Baroque in Venice. I've spent yeah. so much, so much of my 20s, you know, my 30s, and for that matter, even you know, I I've spent a lot of time in the poetry community, and Beyond Baroque was one of the first poetry venues that I really spent a lot of time at, and it's where I met Wanda Coleman and where I met Scott Wanberg and became friends with people like S.A. Griffin and the, the um, it was kind of the, the punk, post-punk, but also even the remnants of the beat generation. And I met a lot of po poets that were inspiring to me. And I met him when I was 22, 23, 24 years old. And, and then a few years later, you know, 10, 15 years later, I started hosting my own shows there even. But Beyond Broke uh, has a great library of, uh, of poetry books and it's where the band X met in the late seventies and just so many, so many links. And, and so beyond broke was definitely a, been, they've been their Wednesday night poetry workshop of song and legend. I think if I'm not mistaken, has never stopped. Like I know they still do it, but I just mean like they never stopped doing it. This they never stopped song. doing it. Yeah. I, Every I think Wednesday. for the last 53, 54 years now, I think. Incredible. Yeah. Since 68. Wow. I yeah, mean, a lot of people seems, came through there. You know, LA, like people like to think, I don't know. I think that is such a beautiful thing because it's not only an incredible destination and yeah, their library and bookstore is an incredible resource, but also like that's LA, that's not only an amazing destination, that's Los Angeles history. You it's know, awesome. and I've heard that Tom Waits went and, and, you know, Ginsburg had been there many times, but also like I got to know it also pretty well through uh, Michael C. Ford, who's a great poet who went to UCLA with Jim Morrison of the doors and Ray Manzarek. And, and so there's just all these different links and a lot, a of, lot great... of poets laureate have come through there mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So That's beyond incredible. broke. Yes. And, there's many different poetry venues I was thinking of, but I, I got to go with Beyond Broke because uh, even it was also, I went there several times before I ever even performed. And I actually even remember hearing Beyond Broke talked about on KCRW in the, in the mid nineties when I first started listening to KCRW when I was 20 or whatever, you know, 18, something like that. So yeah, marvelous. All right. Fantastic. So far, so good. I knew it. What else? You know, the next one I'm going to go with is is the Great Wall of Los Angeles, Judy Baca's Great Wall of Los Angeles. And that's it's a it's a wonderful mural. And and for so long, it was the longest mural in the world. And I've heard I've heard there may be a mural in Korea just as long now. So as you all know, when they always yeah, say it's, it's but Judy's, still, Judy's still working on it. 
Yeah, no, there's an extension of the Great Wall coming. Yeah, and they got that uh, with the, was it the Mellon Foundation? They've just oh, got that. Yeah. Wow. yeah, and they're expanding the Great Wall. And But I love the Great Wall for many reasons. Number one, it's it's a people's history of L.A. Uh, for women and people of color, but it's it's a 10,000-year history of California. Um, it's 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 just... Everything about the Great Wall is so influential, how inclusive it is, how many different histories are covered, how many different, uh, the fact that between 350 and 400 young people helped her paint it and, and they were and they were paid, she found ways to get grants to, and many of them were at risk youth and, and she purposely got people from all different neighborhoods. And, and so what it represents, uh, not just the final result and the product, but the entire process and the community input and the Great Wall of Los Angeles. And also I, I have taken about 10 classes there on field trips over the last five years. I'm going to be taking a group of students there in a month from actually three and a half weeks from now, I'm taking um, four different classes to the Great Wall. It's, it's a great field did their, trip. Did their brains just explode? I mean, I can only yeah. imagine what seeing that, like seeing it now as, you know, a grown adult who knows art stuff is still mammothly impressive but i can only imagine like what that would have meant as a teenager you know you know stefano block who was the graffiti artist formerly known as cisco who was in cbs he wrote about in his book going all city and he and i have actually spoke about this as well he said that he grew up across the street from the great wall for much he went to the high school there that's grant high school which is right next to it and he said that that wall was the first place he saw things about the internment camps and, and he saw and it, it politicized him. And he said, you know, he was a graffiti artist, but then he went to junior college. And then, you know, 10 years later, he has a Ph.D. in geography. But he wrote in his book that Judy Baca's Great Wall was part of his own awakening, political awakening. And, and yeah. so. And, you know, there I, must I, be thousands of people who feel that way, who you know, mm -hmm. went in, you know, maybe didn't go into academia or what a profession mm -hmm. where we would hear from them now, but who carry that experience in their life. I mean, it has to, mm -hmm. it has to have been. And I remember, you know, Mola, I, I, Mola did a show and about it a couple of years and they had this new Good show from when you and I were kids, probably six or seven. And I'm a little, a couple years older than you. And it like made the nightly news because one of the volunteers got like swept away in a flash flood and they had to helicopter rescue them or whatever. Miss B. But, yeah. But while they were there following that drama, they also started interviewing. I mean, and maybe it was a separate, I'm sure it was a separate story, but like they also were in, started interviewing some of these youth that you made reference to who were making it. So there's like news footage of those teenagers being asked what it meant to them to be working on it mm -hmm. at the time. And it's what you're describing. It's mm -hmm. life changing. Judy really, she believed that uh, she has a say, phrase. She says, collaborate first, then paint. She's, and she's a wise woman, you know, and nature. I, I love her. I, she has an essay called Whose Story Do You Tell? And it's a, about the public art. And it was an essay she wrote in the mid 90s. Uh, and and she talked about public art in a mini culture society. And um, I, I, you know, she was talking about taking monuments down then all of these things that are happening now. She was talking about 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I think that's such an, a great choice, too, because, again, it's not only like just go it's it's as impressive as the grand canyon mm -hmm. but like what it contains in terms mm -hmm. of not only like the history but kind of all the histories mm -hmm. of los mm -hmm. angeles because you know you'll find stuff in there about like rfk and mm -hmm. you know national events things that didn't happen in la but have impacted communities here mm -hmm. so it's not like myopic but at the same mm -hmm. time like you said it goes back to like free history mm -hmm. and you know i later on learned that she studied at the siqueiros institute in mexico for two years or, or for a year and siqueiros had already passed but she adopted part of his polyangular perspective and so she she linked it to 
the great Mexican muralist, but as as everyone knows, Judy also very much pushed it forward and completely innovated as well. But it's a it's a, a good mixture of the best part of tradition with the best part of pushing something forward. I agree. And it's, you know, it's kind of, uh, well, we're not going to spin again. Oh, digression alert. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I said I wouldn't. But in speaking to Judy, it's been really interesting because as someone who, who studied art history, one of the things I've had to unre adjacent learn is that art history has for far too long been default meaning Western European art history, you know, made by white, mostly men. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, actually art history, like every other kind of history is much more plural than that. So she's reaching back into an insanely rich visual culture tradition that is its own art history and then merging that. And I think like that's a conversation that, has to happen in the whole discipline of art history needs to be for lack of a better word decolonized so i feel like and just like you said but we're all having this word cloud buzz about that now judy's knew that in the 70s he was doing it in the 70s <laughs> and it was it was yeah. her master's thesis at cal state northridge right and here we are <laughs> yeah sorry it took so long but you were right about everything <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah. Go see the wall and give yourself time. Yeah. You know, I, 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 and it's Woodbury where I teach is about 10, 15 minute drive from there. And so I even feel bad because we only have about an hour. We go for about an hour, but it's, it's about a 10 or 15 minutes to walk along the whole river. But I give students a, a pretty introductory writing response actually just one one semester i did two things where i had them do their midterm essay on it and i also i would do both a creative writing response and an analytical response and a little bit of both and this next time we want to actually create a mural at woodbury university where i'm teaching and we're figuring out how to do it with we're figuring out how to do it as you know with the logistics and everything but we want to create a Woodbury wall of love and we're going to read the bell hooks book all about love and, and dialogue about, about love and not just um, community love, brotherly love, sisterly love, romantic love, like everything of what love means parental. And and we're going to dialogue about that. And um, there's a thing called the one book, one campus program. And I'm actually the head of that committee at Woodbury where I teach. And, and so this year we chose the bell hooks book but Bell Hooks talks and all about love, about a piece of public art near the university where she taught in the, in the East Coast. And it was a quote about love. And she had just had her heart broken. And that piece of public art about love got her to think a lot about, about the meaning of love. And, and so she opens up her book with that. And I thought, well, if we're going to open up, if we're going to use that book. I'm going to take the students to the Great Wall of L.A. and we're going to dialogue about it and and then connect it to Baca's community ideas and and um and and get into the dialectic oh, I want to take your class <laughs> we we may need to have you Can come I at audit some point. it we Not may have credit. to we may have to have you come at some point too because I do a little bit of we do a little bit of art history and we do a little bit of the conversation but you know mostly I Mostly I'm just trying to get them inspired. I mean, we do, we do do some breakdowns, but a lot of the points of these, I'm mostly teaching 100 level classes. I teach some upper division, but a lot of it is just to get them the bug. I just want to get them curious. I just want to get them hungry. Yeah. I'll come out there and make sure they know how lucky they are. Professor Mike. We need to have you come. (laughs) All right. Oh my gosh. Your choices are incredible. Are we up to four? Oh, so we did, we did beyond, we did, um, the Cascades Park, Park, Beyond, Beyond the Road, Road, Great Wall the of Great Los Wall. Angeles. Okay, so, you know, number four might be the most traditional, and I apologize if it's too typical, but I'm going to go with L.A. City Hall. Oh, okay. And and the, the reason why is that it's, it's amazing art deco. John Parkinson, John and Donald Parkinson, the father and son team. It's an incredible building of Art Deco. And, you know, they use water with all 21 Spanish missions to build it and sand from all 58 counties 
are were, were used to build it. And um, there's oh, a pyramid on the top. There's a pyramid on the top of it to celebrate the Aztec influence. But I I love Art Deco, and I like those old poured concrete buildings. And of course, all there's the Griffith Observatory and Bullock's Wilshire and all of these different buildings that were. And of as you know, the New York Deco, the Empire State Building, and the Chrysler Building, all of that was built in the twenties and the thirties. And I'm City Hall was in a Parkinson Building right now. Amazing, I know. amazing. Yeah, you know, <laughs> um, so City Hall captured that opulence of that twenties Deco. But a few reasons why I like City Hall so much is that there's a observation deck on the twenty seventh floor that you can go to the top of for free. Anybody can go to the top of L.A. City Hall, and a lot of people don't know that. I and knew so, it was up there, but I thought it, you had to be special. No, all you got to do is show them your driver's license, and you go up there for free. So, I. When I taught 11th grade, and also just through many years of tour guiding, I've gone up there with dozens of school groups, and we've even done poetry readings at the top of City Hall. But there is a beautiful observation deck up there, and it's it's not the Empire State Building at 102 floors, but it's 27 floors up, and you get to see the whole city, and it's it's not open on Saturday and Sunday. It's only open Monday through Friday, but it is a fun, fun excursion. And I've been doing it a lot over the last 15 years. I'm going to take a group of students from from another high school in two weeks from now over there again. So Amazing. it's it's. I had no idea that people could just go up there. And you know what? I love that you pick City Hall because I live a couple blocks from there, and City Hall features prominently, as well it should, in every news chopper shot of every protest and every unrest. And, you know, of course, it's the seat of government. And, you know, I like none of that, I, you know, that all makes perfect sense. But you very rarely hear it mentioned as um, someplace it's lovely to go when you're not mad about anything and you just want to be in part of the infrastructure of the city and all those facts. And I'm sure there are more that you were speaking of within like that, like the whole like getting, you know, sand. I mean, okay, sand from all the 58 parts of the, the county, 58 place. counties. Yeah. Okay. First of all, that's huge. But, all, but, you know, water from the missions is like a little more problematic now that we know what was really up with the missions. But at the time, you know, and, you know, the pyramid to rep, I mean, I had no idea that that pyramid shape was any kind of homage to anything latino south american mesoamerican i had yeah. no idea that that's where that came from so i'm actually if that's i mean not what that's not what i expected and you know in the 1920s architecture all of that neoclassical revival i've heard before that some of it was trying to represent the imperial ambitions of america and and it is there are there are a lot of problematic elements about that and it's um but, you know, the interesting thing is, is there, I guess one of the things I'm saying is that was the end of the handcrafted era. They said after the 40s and 50s, after the Second World War, that's when tracked houses started to get built. The freeways got started to get built. That's when the the chain restaurants came, the McDonald's and, and all of the the chains. And I always joke around on my tours and say these days they just, you know, add a Starbucks sign and everything, add water and throw up a Starbucks sign or or, or not just Starbucks, but, you know, every every name, every chain yeah. you can think of. And no, so and a lot of I mean, it is a gorgeous building and I think it deserves to be appreciated in a way out of context. If that. Makes yeah. Sense. Yeah. And, and so uh, that Art Deco 20 style to me is is a beautiful sort of old L.A. And, you know, they talk about the Hollywood sign as icons and the Griffith, Griffith Observatory is killer. I mean, I, I was going to choose Griffith, too. But City Hall and also I'll say another thing. My dad worked for the parks, the Department of Recreations and Parks in the 60s for five years. And he always says he never should have quit that job. He ended up doing something else and went and and if he would have kept that job, he'd have a really nice big pension right now. But he didn't. You know, he went and did some other stuff and. Uh, he always says that that was probably the best job that he ever had. And when my parents first got married, that's where he was working and they were living in Long Beach. But he my dad grew up in Inglewood and he worked in he worked in City Hall for five years from I, I want to say like 
63 to 69 or something or, or no 63 to 68 or something like he was working in city hall at the time and and so some of it also is my dad and i have gone to the top actually i went to the top way before with before i did it with my dad but last year i took my dad and my kids and i we all went to the top of city hall and had a went to Philippe's afterwards and you know just I did mean, some you know, old you LA mentioned stuff. the empire state building like i grew up in new york and it's both super cheesy and super amazing. Mm-hmm. And I didn't go until I was a teenager because it's not like on your way to anywhere. But when you do, you go with your parents and it, mm-hmm. it was, you know, it, it, it was magical. Like you're, mm-hmm. it, and it doesn't have to be a hundred stories to have that experience and a look at the city the, the in, you know, there aren't that many now downtown. There's some obviously that's changed, but at 27 stories, that was more than twice the height of every other building in town. Because of that height and limit, it's, city hall was the only building taller than the height limit for about 35, 40 years, all the way until the late sixties. It was so the tallest building in LA. Everything else is 12 time. and it's mm-hmm. 27. Mm-hmm. That counts as a skyscraper. Mm-hmm for mm-hmm. most of its life right and now yeah. you see it and it's like adorable but mm-hmm. i love mm-hmm. the idea that you can remember a time when it was mm-hmm. epic in mm-hmm. our in, in, before you could even call it a skyline you know and what what i like about deco you know and i guess maybe the chrysler building oh you know union state union station some people say la's union station is span deco half spanish colonial half art deco i've heard that before <laughs> i've never heard that but it's my favorite thing now yeah, you know the, the deco the clean lines and the geometry of it, it there is there is a beauty there is an aesthetic beauty to it and and that and going to the top of it, so that's that's why I chose City Hall because, in some ways, as you said, most people have another associ- association with it. But, but I love what you said about the handcraftedness. Like mm-hmm. that was, you would imagine no other way for that to be built than skilled tradespeople. Mm-hmm. I've heard think about that that the craft that really after the Second World War, almost all of that was gone because it was just so expensive. But in the twenties and thirties was maybe the tail end of it. And and then it, the era closed. <laughs> I'm glad we have it before it had a chance to be some big steel and glass. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. I think even mm-hmm. Spandeco, even as like, Oh my God, as that is, is kind of, I mean, if LA had an early signature style, mm-hmm. it would mm-hmm. be Spandeco. Yeah, you're right because that Spanish colonial was so influential. But then the Deco was was at the rise of the 20s, you know, and the the boom, the roaring 20s, and the rise the rise of Hollywood, and you know, the movie palaces and the neon signs, and and a lot of what you see in the noir films and all of that were 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 in that kind of glamour. I love it. Oh, I love it. See, you're making me think about my own building where I live in a whole new way. So that's the genius of Five Places LA. Uh, all right, last one before we uh, get into honorables, which I know, you know are going to be good too. The last one is maybe the most personal and it, it might be the most obscure to people, but it would be the, the Risho Kosakai Buddhist Temple in Boyle Heights. Risho Kosakai Buddhist Temple on East 1st Street. And it's a building that's over 100 years old. And, and the reason... Well, number one, I I was married at that temple, but it's also, it's an interesting place because for 10 years, it was a synagogue in the 20s, like teens and 20s. And then uh, the Higashi Higanji, a a Japanese, a Japanese Buddhist church bought it. And then in the 1970s, Risho Kosakai, which is another sect of Buddhism, bought it. And, And so this building is over 110 years old and three different, um, faiths have been in there but B- Boyle Heights has always been the most multi-faith multi-ethnic neighborhood of LA and so Brooklyn Avenue yeah Brooklyn Avenue so this this temple Risho Kosakai oh. is on East First Street and it's across the street from the Food for Less Market and it's a real intergenerational three generations and it's mostly elder Japanese folks and a lot of them that have been to Boyle Heights for a long time and also just people from all over Southern California but uh, for example, there's a young, you know, Chicano assistant rever- reverend there, and and it's just it's 
we've been doing poetry events there and it's just a kind of a it's a they're really big on interfaith dialogue and so what's really cool about it is, is it's this place that really builds unity and they have these really cool barbecues and uh i most of all love la for the people and and this this buddhist temple in boyle heights the risho kosakai is just this really warm special place that every time you go there you you feel well you feel welcomed and so um it, that's my fifth choice just because it, it's been really cool to me that's beautiful and also it sounds i mean that's kind of what i love about la something can have a hundred plus year history that isn't necessarily known about beyond the neighborhood that it's a treasure mm -hmm. Like everyone mm -hmm. there knows about it, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be a lot more people, I would guess, like me who are going, that sounds amazing and have never crossed paths with that. So, there's, wow. There's a Japanese Saturday school that my daughter goes to one block from there on Saratoga Street that's been there since 1929 or something like that. And um, and so there's this, and then there's another church called the Tenrikyo, which is actually uh, in an original Japanese faith. Um, and, and so there's this three or four block stretch of East first street in Boyle Heights, right by Evergreen cemetery that still has okay. the last vestiges of the Japanese history and the Atoma San restaurant, which is this Japanese restaurant that's been there over 60 plus years. And so there's this little sect of, you know, little small section of East first street in, on, in Boyle Heights. And, I wouldn't know that much about it if I hadn't spent a lot of time at that temple. And, and I met a lot of really cool people there and, and just a real um, welcoming, friendly place. <laughs> no, I love that for you, but I also love that for, for your kid because what an amazing way to keep that part of their history alive for them, for you. We just marched in the Nisei week parade in little Tokyo a few weeks ago. And uh, the the church has been marching in that forever, and my my wife has marched in the parade like twenty times. I've I've actually marched in the parade about five times now, <laughs> and uh, it's a fun it's a fun. To me, it just really captures L.A. and also even Boyle Heights, and and it's like a, almost like a place where time forgot in some ways. And the layering of history is so. I mean, that's everywhere, but mm -hmm. I think it's been fairly recently that a critical mass of people have become aware of it in Los Angeles. Yeah. Fair to say. Yeah. Uh, so that it's commonly spoken of to think about how many histories are stacked on top of each other here. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that hasn't always been the way that LA talked about itself. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so your examples that encapsulate that I think are so beautiful. Oh, thank you, Shana. Yeah. I'm going to invite you to a barbecue over there. It's just a good, good no. vibes, good folks. I'm coming yeah. to all your shit. Are you kidding me? Oh, I mean your stuff. I'm coming to your poetry meetings on top of City Hall. I'm coming <laughs> to your barbecues at the Buddhist temple. What up? Yeah, <laughs> let me know. I mean, this sounds like the greatest stuff you could do in the city. Uh, Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, that is already such a richness. But um, honorable mentions fire away. And then I have a wild card question for you waiting on the other side. Okay. I have several, you know, different honorable mentions, but of course, Lamert Park Village, where I did a lot of poetry events and I would have said SO on books, but they closed last year. Um, but my first teaching job was at View Park High School at Crenshaw on 57th, just uh, a mile south of Lamert Park Village. But we did a lot of events in the Lamert Park Book Festival and um went to a lot of events at the world stage and so Lamert Park was another place you know as equally influential for me as Beyond Baroque and so I've spent a lot of time in Lamert Park and the Lamert Park Village is definitely in my in my honorable mentions uh the Suhiro restaurant in Little Tokyo my favorite little Japanese restaurant that's you know open till two three in the morning and actually they're, they're moving to fourth street but are yeah. they moving or is it a, a, a second location I think their their first street location is closing because of the land the 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 original building owner died and now the children of the of the original landlord owns uh, is forcing them out because of the rise in rent but it's so and, and you why know don't and, children understand the importance of history 
you know, and Suhiro, you know, is one of the two or three oldest restaurants in Little Tokyo. It's been there since the early seventies, but as you know, you know, 52, 52 years, 54 years is, is a long time in this era. And, uh, Suhiro had been in Little Tokyo since I think 71 or 72 on and East first street. First street is, is the heart and soul of Little Tokyo. So Suhiro is, is one of our very favorite restaurants and that's very much in my honorable mention and, um, well, hit me up when you come to the new location. I'll we'll yeah. walk across the street. Robert Vargas painted a mural in there too. A new one for when it's going to open? In, in the new one, yeah. I haven't, I okay. just saw them, they posted it on social media, but I haven't seen it in person yet. And I'll go check it out. And then a, another honorable mention is this is going to sound, this is a little bit out there, but uh, the Cerritos Library. In the oh, city right. of Cerritos has this three story library. That looks like the Disney concert hall almost. I mean, it's like the silver titanium and the city of Cerritos um, has the auto square. So they have all the sales tax revenue. It's it's not a super wealthy city or anything, but the city itself has money because they have the, the sales tax from the auto square. And um, I lived in Cerritos and my mom still lives there. My mom's lived there over 50 years. And there was a library there that was originally one story and then it was two story. And then in the early two thousands, they turned it into three stories. But uh, one of my childhood best friends is a librarian there. And, and uh, I've been doing a lot of poetry events at the Cerritos library because it's this beautiful library with this real nice place. And we're teaching a poetry workshop on geographic literacy. And we're going to be doing a project with the California state park system. And so the Cerritos library is this beautiful park. I mean, this beautiful library and this really interesting little library, um, one of the most beautiful libraries in all of Southern California. I had no idea. And the way it ties together that you're doing a workshop there in conjunction with the parks people give in your fam your dad with the park. Oh, my heart is like racing. It's so it's like it writes itself a little the shape of the story, it's like no notes. It's all in there. It all comes back around. At, you know, at the end. It's so beautiful. Thanks, wow. Shana. Yeah, you know those those spots. I'm so proud we, of myself for inviting you. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you. When you know there was, there was a lot of other places I was thinking of. Um, another restaurant is Spoon House, this Japanese Italian place in Gardena. <laughs> what the? Have hell? you ever had Japanese? Hey, you're, you you're just messing with me now. You're have you ever had Japanese Italian before? Uh, there's a place called Monzo. On we love Monzo. We love, I love Monzo. Monzo. The Miso Carbonara. With the I get that. I love the Miso Carbonara. Like, yeah. Where am I? Mm -hmm. I think I, I think about it sometimes. Like just when I'm not there, like it'll come into my mind. There's a really good Carbonara at um at Spoon House in Gardena. All right. It's on, it's on Redondo Beach Boulevard, and it's it, it's down there in the South Bay, but it's a dynamite restaurant. The Spoon it's called Spoon House. Spoon House. And um. Okay. I've been going there for almost 20 years. My wife's been going there for like 30 years, but it's funny. I went there last year and I hadn't gone in a while and I was reading on the wall. There was a Jonathan Gold review of it in 1991. That and he wrote, because I guess they opened in the late eighties, but he wrote this incredible, he wrote this incredible piece for the LA times about, about spoon house in the early nineties. Oh. And, um, but it's just this really cool little Japanese pasta restaurant. And I love it. I love it. Thank you. That's great. And I love that. I mean, you know, speaking of invoking, you know, John, the immortal Jonathan Gold, you know, I guess that you could, pro I think the extrapolation from how important his writing was is that you could in fact do this literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you can do a history of an entire city in the form of a history of its food mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is something that I think Los Angeles is particularly well suited for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Jonathan Gold, I remember I lived in Koreatown in the early 2000s and I had a single apartment at one point for $425 a month, you know, and uh, I was a young single broke poet, you know, and, um, but I, I was reading some of the Jonathan Gold reviews and there was, he talked, he talked about Taylor Steakhouse on eighth street. And it was all these places that I, I was, some of them I was finding on my own, but then he'd always been there first. And then, you know, um, 
I haven't written so much about food, but I admired his his authenticity and the way his project with Pico. And and so I I definitely was not only a big Jonathan Gold fan, but I I, I dug the way he his appreciation and the way he would know the names of all the dishes and he would get to know the cooks and just his 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 warmth and his authenticity. Yeah, and the way in which his true subject was the city itself. Mm-hmm. You know, it, mm-hmm. it wasn't this top down, like, this is good, this is bad, this is best, this is better. Mm-hmm. It it was, you're eating, but you're absorbing, you're learning, mm-hmm. you're in the milieu, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. have gone to the place, because it's not like he sat in his apartment and ordered it all on Grubhub. That man was in his car. So, you know, what else could you learn about the city? Everything while you're mm-hmm. on your way to eat every taco mm-hmm. on the street mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. the beach to the mountains. And like, I feel like there's a reason why his fans um, don't mm-hmm. are, not, are like, don't all come from the world of food writing. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. people that he was an influence on are not all food writers by any stretch. That's so, well said. Yeah, I think, you know, well, well met. I think he, uh, I, I, I feel that spirit in the way that you approach the city too. That's pretty cool. Oh, thank pretty you, cool, Mike. And speaking of which, this is my wild card question for you. Are you ready? You ready for yeah. it? A little birdie tells me you might have a book coming out of your own pretty soon. Would you like to tell folks Man, thank it? you. You know what? I'm, I'm, Right now, the second edition of my book, Letters to My City, just came out. We have a brand new cover. I have two new essays, including one essay about working, about knowing Mike Davis for 25 years, and he was my professor at UCLA. And then another essay about local history and how all history is local, what happened here. Um, So the second edition of Letters to My City just, just came out. Second edition with new material. Yeah, with some new material. And I'm in the process of actually, I'm about 99% done with another book that I'm I'm actually in the process of getting ready to go with. But re- this second edition just came out of Letters to My City. And That's I'm doing some readings. I'm going to be reading with DJ Waldy at Page Against the Machine in Long Beach on 4th Street. And uh, I love 4th Street in Long Beach. That's a really cool area too. You know, I think you're in a little bit of a situation um with some of with for example some of the work in letters to my city which was already an anthology of previous of largely previous work when it came out the first time that i think you have been laying the groundwork for a level of interest in local history that's really just fully blossoming now you know outside of the disciplines that might not be right like there's academics and there's writers and there's a community of people who've always cared but yeah. I think the idea of people really pulling apart what Los Angeles is and how it got this way, um, I feel like I'm I'm seeing it happen afresh right now. A new generation mm-hmm. of people making sure the indigenous communities are in the story mm-hmm. this time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, uh, and other versions of that, we're all engaged in looking at our city again right and now. They're, they're building the monument. Um in Chinatown. Yes. Yes. And for and the Chinese for massacre. In that monument conversation, you know, you look at like Glenn Kaino's show that's up at the uh, Japanese American National Museum right now about his grandparents' market and his, how his family history mirrors LA history. That kind of stuff, I think, is getting the respect that it deserves as subject matter mm-hmm. um, now. And so, mm-hmm. but you're already, you're like, um, it's the second edition of my book. <laughs> You're too nice to take credit, so I'm going to do it for you. You were ahead, I think, of the curve on some of this. So, yeah, you know, there, it's amazing to me. There is a lot of young, up and coming historians, and a lot of people doing a lot of different neighborhoods and and doing different places. And I have a great student of mine, Julissa Padilla, who's doing a whole thing about the San Fernando Valley, and she grew up in Pacoima and Silmar, and. She's a 25 year old young lady, but she's she loves the old history and and she's really done a bunch of great research on the San Fernando Valley. And for her thing, she's like, everybody's already talked about 
the West Side or everybody's always talked about Hollywood. So her thing is the Valley, you know, valley. and yeah. Um, I met another guy who calls himself the hood historian and he's doing stuff on Compton and Long Beach. And and, and there's just all uh, another guy, Javier Servin. Um, he calls himself Fool Hauser. And, and he's doing great work. He did a great piece on Pio Pico recently and he's doing stuff on, on, he did a cool thing on the Sears tower in East LA, the art deco <laughs> Sears tower in East LA. You all would have loved that. Like, he would have loved that. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's still here. He would have loved that more than anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I was going to mention Hul because it's very tempting to think, oh, you know, white guy, whatever, kind of folksy. But A, if you're really paying attention, he went deep and was very mm -hmm. fearless. Mm -hmm. Just because he had a big golly gee smile on his face, mm -hmm. he took stuff on. Mm -hmm. and he was another one who was kind of ahead of his time and I think he'd be really happy to know that he was an influence on that generation you know I think what Hauser did I mean many great things but I guess you know maybe bottom line is the way he respected human dignity you didn't feel a condescending as you said earlier when we talked about the top down and the the hierarchical Hugh Hauser had a had a real way of, of of seeing everybody and bringing everybody in, and the way his ability to see human dignity and to let every and let other people shine too. He was yeah. really good at letting them shine, and he didn't have to be the star, but it, he was the star the whole time while making everybody else the star. And and uh, his enthusiasm, you know, he was not on TV to sound smart. He was on TV to like express wonder mm -hmm, and, you know, mm -hmm. he's out there going wow and I so relate to that because I can't help it either I'm like that's amazing you know I I, I can't stay buttoned up when something's that exciting and he turned that into a whole life you're right about that wonder we need that wonder and and the, the wonder and the awe are, are re-energizing and when we're all when we're tired and all you know but you go out on a Saturday and you know, if the time my buddy Phil and I stumbled on the Cascades or, or even just even sometimes, even sometimes architecture can do it for me. I mean, nothing does it better than nature. Nothing does it better than, you know, going on a hike or looking at a sunset in the ocean, but sometimes even a beautiful building can do it, you know? And the way they interact. And that's, you know, one thing that LA is amazing at is architecture and nature. Mm -hmm, mm, like there's, there's no an way interplay. around it. Right, mm -hmm. big and wide and flat, and you can see the mountains from everywhere. Mm -hmm. But you kind of have to, yeah. The way that you yeah. don't like, you can be in New York, and if you're not, if the park, not counting like the parks, you're not necessarily walking around remembering that nature is there. Let's just yeah. Say. And you know, I was like, oh my god, it's so beautiful! It's the greatest city in the world, but not everywhere has that relationship to nature that we have. We do, we do have this great relationship to nature and, and the foothills and uh, Woodbury where I teach is next to the Verdugo mountains and the Verdugo are not as well known as the Santa Monica mountains, but they're that little range that connects Glendale and Burbank and the 210 is on the other side of them. And they're, they're a beautiful little, little mountain range. And our school is tucked up right next to the five in Glen Oaks, right up next to it in Burbank and almost to Sun Valley. But there's some times where the the sun is shining on it and the chaparral foliage and it's it's beautiful. There's one room that I teach in that has has big windows and you can see the Verdugo. And I always tell students, this is my favorite room because we can see the Verdugo right now. <laughs> you know? Exactly. That's what I mean. It's and see, you're the class. You're the one professor that would be like, let's all take a minute and just stare out the window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get in trouble for staring out the window in my class, right? Yeah, we do we do the what I call the quick write and we start the first class first 8 or 10 minutes of the class with a little with a little journaling and a writing and sometimes I give them a prompt and sometimes I even let them do the old free write but most of the time there's a prompt or something but a quick write and and that's to to get them to get the juices flowing and and start our conversation. You to come over here and do that um every morning, please. You know, I'm a big, I always talk about this, but I, I love Julia Cameron and Natalie Goldberg. I love those two women. Those are, those are just two great writing coaches, uh, you know, philosophies of writing. I've been writing. pages for a while, but 
I lack discipline. I you guess know, is the reason sometimes my morning pages become a become the laundry list. The, I do the morning pages as a, as a way to try to organize myself. If you're still doing it, then maybe I'll start again because that yeah. whatever you're doing seems to be working. Well, okay. Speaking of writing process, here's a bumpy segue, not that bumpy people. Speaking of people who are amazing at writing, uh, who is your plus one? Who do you nominate? And bear in mind, you will be the one interviewing them on El Zumo when your turn comes. I'm I've decided to for to be the great Linnell George. Linnell George, yeah, Linnell George. She's a the favorite. The crowd goes line. wild. She is such a treasure. Tell us why. Well, Linnell has you know not only been writing about LA so long, and and she was good friends with Jonathan Gold, for example, but she just knows LA inside and out, and and she has a warmth. And I've always thought that there was an elegance to her prose. There's a real elegance to her prose, and. I can ask her about a certain restaurant or something and, and she could tell me oh, that, you know, she used to go there and and we can always talk about a lot of whether it be books, different locations. And Linnell just knows LA, but also has a love of it. I think in the same spirit that you and I have and, um, yeah. and Linnell and I both, both knew Mike Davis. The last time I saw Mike Davis, I was with Linnell and Linnell and I would, would take drives to Mike Davis's house sometimes. And we did that a few times. And uh, um, Mike Davis was talking about Linnell when I first discovered her work when I was at UCLA. Mike, you know, when I was in his class, Mike Davis was always giving uh, much praise to Linnell and, and Ruben Martinez and Brian Cross. So Linnell is, uh, is, is a favorite of mine and is Perfect next choice. You're absolutely right. No one loves or knows this city better mm -hmm. than her. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I are I, amazing. I can't, I already can't wait to see that interview between the two of you. Wow. Well, wow, thank oh, you, okay. Shana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate you letting me just throw you in. I, I sort of emailed you and I was like, um, I have a, uh, made this agreement on your behalf <laughs> <laughs> you're going to appear in this series with me but uh, you're such a jolly kind enthusiastic tireless human that I knew you'd make it I knew you'd make time for me and I knew you would be amazing so I cannot thank you enough thank you Shana that. thank you I'm a huge fan of you and can I do this little bit of this poem Los Angeles A to Z Around Arcadia, Alhambra, and Artesia after Atwater and Arlita along Atlantic, big rig trucks blow by Balboa, Bellflower, Beverly Hills, and Burbank, but not Bergamont. Burbs, Becom, Connectors, Cool Out and Carson, Crenshaw, Covina, Cudahy, Culver City, Coldwater Canyon, and Commerce Casino. Commuters catch that crunch down, Doheny delivering dudes to Downey. Don't dismiss Dolby and downtown Disney. Eventually, east of El Monte is easier than El Segundo. Exit at Awanda for Ford factories far faster than Flower, Figueroa. Fontana, Flora, and Fauna. Grove's got ghosts in Glendale on Glen Oaks. Gates got closed in Garden Grove, Gardena, and Garvanza. How many hosts had high hopes in Hollywood? How about Halloween's home in Hawthorne? Who got hoodooed on Hoover? How about hype in Hacienda Heights? Is it intricate on Imperial? Is industry invisible to individuals in Inglewood? Is it indivisible to jump junctions on Jefferson? Juxtapose jets again. Justice is jettisoned in a jurisdiction. Kicking it in Koreatown. Catch karma clowns down cataloging key kinetic characters living in Los Angeles and Lenox. Look up at Long Beach's long streets like Lakewood. Learn about La Mirada, La Palma, La Puente, Lomita, and Lawndale. Meet more see in Montebello. Monty and Montrose. Make a mark in Monterey Park. Maybe more in Monrovia. Nobody's knows Norton on Normandy or north of Northridge or their neighbors off Nordoff and North Hollywood. Oh, Olympic, Olive and Alvera Street, order over in Orange County, operate on Ontario's observatory, pedestrians pose in Pico Rivera pursuing passion in Pasadena, pour it out in Paramount, queue up quickly at Queen of the Valley, quest quintessentially for quality at Quiet Canyon. Remember Robertson, the Rose Bowls, Rosecrans, Rose Hill, and Rosemead. Somewhere south of Santa Ana, Sam Sanders sings San Marino's song saluting Soto. Tourists take trains to Trader Joe's, Tulare, Turnbull Canyon, Torrance, Tuhunga, and Tarzana. 
Under Universal City up to Union Station, up above University, Voyager's Vibe on Vermont and Victory, viewing Van Nuys, Valley Village, and Victorville's vicinity, wandering west to Watts, catching westerns on Winnetka, West Adams, and Westchester, examine Excelsior's exposition along Eximino, exiting Xanadu. You got Young Yogurt on York Boulevard, Youthful Unity in Yosemite, Zanku is Zen, zone into Zeitgeist, zip up your zoot suit, and zoom, 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 zoom Zion to Zuma. Los Angeles A to Z. Oh, I love you. I love you too, Shannon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hit the end of the record button and sign off now, but my, my heart is so full. To learn more about Mike the Poet's work and the people and places mentioned in this conversation, please check out the show notes. I highly recommend reading Mike's wonderful prose and poetry, as well as the beautiful Jonathan Gold review of Spoonhouse in Gardena and the gorgeous books about LA recommended in Mike's annual list for LA Taco. To hear more stories of the places that define Los Angeles, please subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're enjoying the show, we would so appreciate if you would leave us a rating, a review, or share it with friends. We're a small, dedicated volunteer team, and every rating and every review helps keep the show going. Five Places is produced by Quinn Wynn and me, Emmanuel Bourlier, for the LA Forum for Architecture and Urban Design. We recognize that we record on the unceded traditional territory and homelands of the Chumash and Tongva people. We honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. Thank you for listening. <laughs>